the flaws of contemporary Venezuela and sends warnings. It shows what can happen if we fail to stand up against democratic backsliding. And this is one of the reasons why we also selected this for the Brussels Festival this year. I am very honored to welcome here our two panelists. Welcome, Annabelle. It's a great, great pleasure to have you here with us. Annabelle Rodriguez Rios is the director of the film Once Upon a Time in Venezuela. She is a Vienna based Venezuelan filmmaker developing concepts for audiovisual storytelling with social impact. She gained masters in filmmaking at the London Film School. Tonight, she's connecting from Colombia. So thank you for being with us here tonight, Annabelle. Thank you very much for having the film here, for having this theme that is so close to our hearts and for having me to share this conversation. And I would also like to welcome Alejandro. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to have you here also tonight. Alejandro Alvarez Iragori is the coordinator of the Venezuelan environmental NGO Clima 21. He's environmental human rights defender and holds doctorate in ecology. Besides environmental rights, he focuses on themes such as climate change and biodiversity. Tonight, he's connecting from Venezuela. Thank you, Alejandro, for being here with us. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Our third panelist, Dita Jaranzova from the Czech Republic, who is the vice president of the European Parliament, unfortunately, could not join us tonight but she sent us a short video that we will play now before we start the discussion. I cannot be with you today in person, but I'm honored to be able to still contribute to, to this debate. So first of all, let me thank people in need for organizing this One World International Human Rights Documentary Film Festival and also touching this year on the situation in Venezuela by screening the documentary Once Upon a Time in Venezuela. I have been working on human rights and democracy in Venezuela for more than six years in the European Parliament. The European Parliament has been and continues to be a strong ally in Venezuela's path towards democracy. We have been quick to condemn abuses of power and human rights violation by the Maduro regime through different resolution statements. We were the ones to push the European Union to adopt targeted sanctions against those responsible for these abuses. We have supported the investigation of cases brought to the International Criminal Court on crimes against humanity committed by the regime. And in 2017, the European Parliament also awarded the Venezuelan Democratic Opposition with the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, which is the highest tribute paid by the European Union to human rights work. And the European Parliament continues to recognize the legitimacy of those democratically elected by Venezuelans, that is President Juan Guaido, and the National Assembly that was last democratically elected in 2015. We see these very elections in the film itself, through the eyes of the people from Congo Mirador. The situation in Venezuela as a whole has only gotten worse. As a Czech, I remember how important international support and solidarity was while we were still under the communist regime. So we must be there for the Venezuelans as well. Venezuela is not just facing a democratic crisis. As this documentary shows, there are many challenges facing the country to do with issues ranging from the environmental degradation, corruption, deep political polarization and mass migration. Once upon a time in Venezuela is not just a story about the floating village of Congo Mirador. It is a reflection of Venezuela as a whole, a once prosperous country that is unraveling. 
a country being drained of its people who flee searching for a better future. A country that is divided, deeply in need of reconciliation to move forward. But also a country of hope. The film manages to capture these multiple crises and puts a human face on what is going on in Venezuela. So I would like to congratulate Annabel Rodriguez for this important portrait of Venezuela and repeat to Venezuelans, the European Union continue to stand with you. We will continue to defend your right to vote in democratic elections. We will support a peaceful solution that leads to reconciliation, to a future of hope. We will continue to support justice through the investigations in the International Criminal Court. Europe has not forgotten you. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank very much to Ms. Karanzova for sending us this uh, video. Before um, I start asking questions about some of the main uh, topics uh, seen in the movie, like mentioned even now in the video, like democracy or environmental challenges, I would like to say that also the audience can ask questions. There are three options how you can ask questions. And that is, if you are watching us on Facebook, please comment, comment under the video. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can also comment under the video. And uh, there is also a third option uh, that you can ask questions via the application Slido. Uh, the information how to access it will be on the screen right now. So these are the three ways. Please um, feel free to ask questions anytime uh, from now on. And with this, without further delays, I would like to ask first question. Uh, this question goes to Annabelle and is related to the movie. I would like to ask you, uh, when did you visit the village, Congo Mirador, where you filmed the movie in the end for the first time? And how or why did you decide to film a documentary there? Yeah, well, once more, I would like to thank and I would like to mention before answering the question that I found absolutely touching the speech of the deputy of the European Union. And I'm quite thankful to, to hear this as a Venezuelan citizen. Uh, it's good to hear that, uh, that, they, that, they, that, they, that such an important monument for the human rights as it, as it is Europe is still standing by us, for us as well. Uh, the first time I went now to the question, the first time I went to the Congo Mirador was uh, years ago in the year 2008. <laughs> and uh, that time, uh, the reason why we went there was to uh, explore uh, the theme of the Venezuelan idiosyncrasy and the icons that have marked us as a culture. And we wanted to um, portray the, the, the Catatumbo lightning, which is actually yeah, nothing less than a, a magic and mysterious um, phenomenon. And uh, this has a lot to do with the, with the Venezuelan and Caribbean, Caribbean characters and yeah, and Venezuelans themselves, of course. And by, back then, I, we established a relationship with the families there, uh, particularly with one family of fishermen kids. And years later, I went back to shoot a, a short documentary about their lives and how, uh, how contrasting was the fact that uh, these families and these kids were in the place where most of the oil <laughs> of the world comes from. And uh, however, they hardly receive the, 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 the material benefits that this means, such an industry. 
And uh, within that uh, within that moment in which we were shooting the film, this this short film that was back in the year 2012, we learned that the, the village was tending to disappear because of this process of sedimentation that you just saw in the film. And uh, the people were asking us to, 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 to show this process and to show what they were going through and overall to make visible their, their, their need of a, of a canalization um, and a dredging uh, work there, which is a major, major uh, hydro, uh, a major engineering work. So, uh, given that uh, we pay more attention to the to what we're, they were going through, and at the same time we were in, into the deep necessity of telling what was happening to us as a society, to us as a, as families, particularly what I can summarize as this phenomenon of phenomena of. Um, polarization and overall um, the deep wounds that the abuse of power leave in families and the most common families. So then this was really the, the major motivation uh, to stay there and portray their process because they were going through the same as we were going through. They were going through the same um, manipulations and uh, yeah, populist practices and so on. And that led us to a five years process of following up these, these uh, processes, these family processes in the village. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, like when I saw the movie, um, that it's one thing to be uh, filming in a quite a difficult place like that, but another thing is also to be filming in a place in midst of uh, a humanitarian crisis, in midst of a political crisis and all of that. Like, how was it for you to film in the middle of, of this situation? Well, it's uh, going one step after the other. And of course, there is a deep commitment to a story that is close to my heart and the heart of most of the people that are in, 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 our, in our crew. Our filming crew is, is a truly creative, uh, you know, um, a group. And uh, I think this is the main thing, the, this, this uh, commitment plus the fact that we belong to that culture and we somehow we know how to move. So uh, that means that we go through things that, yeah, they are difficult, but we have adapted to those. Uh, for instance, just to say a couple of things, uh, in Congo Mirador, there is no sewage or, there, or, or, or potable or drinkable water. And then we just had to deal with, deal with it and how well we would bring the water and uh, we would go into the wild for, for uh, doing our thing and, uh, and to have showers, we would go into the lagoons and, you know, do first with our feet like this in the water to, 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 to push the alligators away and, and, to, and to wash there and be absolutely happy under the open sky you know? um, this is as a light si side of it there another side of things is that um, the area is highly paramilitarized that means that there are many armed groups uh, which happens as well in Colombia um, and this had become part of, of, of the day-to-day -day life uh, in some in some um, layers of society is more visible than others. But if you want to be a filmmaker in Venezuela, you just have to deal with it. And if you want to say it's a story, you just have to deal with it. So, and this is what the commitment takes. Yeah? And, and we did, and actually, and, and this, with this I close uh, this idea, actually it was possible to do it. It's, it was possible for us to sit in this, on the same table with the people of the film that you just saw, like Tamara, uh, Senor Camarillo, etc. And at the other side, we would have a, 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 a young paramilitary, because when you see these paramilitaries, the, at least the ones that are the executors, they are just kids, really. So 
we were able to see it with, you know, with ones and the others and to, and to, and to talk. And I think um, once we go, once one goes uh, further than the fear, it is, it is actually possible to talk with everyone, or at least that's the experience we made in this, in, in, in the process of making this film. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, my next question goes to Alejandro. I would like to ask you, Alejandro, uh, what you thought, what were your emotions uh, when you saw this movie? You are Venezuelan, you are based in the capital, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you are a biologist, uh, an environmentalist. So what did this mean for you? Is this reality shown by this movie known to most people in Venezuela? Primero, igual que Anabel, quiero felicitar a As uh, Anabel has said, I would like to thank uh, the uh, MEP for her words. This is very important for us in Venezuela. Secondly, I would like to congratulate Anabel for what she has achieved. She has captured circumstances that could be similar in other parts of Venezuela with uh, stereotypical elements that could practically be copied in many other places of Venezuela. When I saw the film, uh, I had heard that it's a, a beautiful film. Uh, you can note how beautiful it is, but it's also very sad for me because what it shows is the destruction of my country. So it seems we lost Alejandro. Go ahead, Alejandro. We lost you for a second, but you can continue. Adelante. Sigo adelante. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. I wanted to say one thing. In these circumstances, the film shows elements that are a combination or a reflection of other bigger circumstances. Venezuela is going through a humanitarian emergency situation. For a long period of time, we have suffered political uh, non-stability, inequality and poverty. It's not a short thing, it's a long process and we can see the result of this process in the movie. There are two elements that uh, are shown in the film, the social and environmental problem that uh, leads to the destruction of the village and also the uh, social and political uh, dimension of it. The sedimentation is a long-term problem, a hundred years perhaps, and uh, a little is being done. It simply continues. Also, there is the political process of repression, control, and harassment. It's relatively shorter, 20 years, and uh, in a greater extent in the past five years. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alejandro. You were uh, mentioning that the sedimentation uh, has been taking place for a very long time. Um, so is this um, closely related with the uh, extraction of oil with the oil industry or not that much in the end? Partially, it is related. Lake Maracaibo is the largest lake uh, of uh, sweet water in uh, our region. It is connected to the sea. However, it is very important in terms of the content of sweet water and uh, the salty water remains outside of the lake. However, as a result of the oil industry, 
uh, you need to dredge the uh, entrance to the lake so that the big ships can enter the lake. And at this moment, the process of exchange between the two types of water was reversed. And the lake is now becoming more and more salty. The oil industry also completely changed the local culture, which was primarily agricultural and export oriented. Oil changed the entire culture of this area. An old uh, native culture that created these villages on the water, pueblos de agua, as they are called in the area. This is now being separated. Congo Mirador was created at the beginnings of the 20th century. It was um, uh, created by people who used uh, small ships, piraguas, who transported goods between Maracaibo and the ports. The, the, the primary ports for exporting the agricultural products. But this agricultural production in the past 100 years has been undergoing changes and it has led to deforestation in the area, in the area of the mountains to the lake. And this um, deepens the impact deforestation and uh, changes in the use of the land have brought about important changes. Sedimentation cannot be stopped simply by dredging the area. You would have to reforest the area and protect all the rivers that end in the lake. It is a comprehensive and uh, long-term process and the Politics never accepted this as a topic. Thank you, Alejandra. I think we will come back in the next round to the topic of uh, how to respond to the crisis and maybe how the government uh, wants to respond to the crisis. But let me get back to Annabelle right now. Um, and when I was watching the movie, um, I I felt that even though we saw that there was oil in the in the fresh water and oil killing um, the, uh, the organisms and also contaminating basically uh, the, the, where the people lived. Um, I, I didn't feel or I couldn't tell if there is uh, some kind of critique within, within this community of oil industry as such, if this um, Venezuelan oil culture, actually, if people that live in the middle of this, if they kind of reflect upon it or if they just take it as something that's simply there. So I would like to maybe ask you a bit more about this um, oil culture, uh, if you could tell us more. Yeah, well, in the, in the experience that we did during that time, I, in my perception, I would say that it is taken as something that just like that, it's there. Um, actually, when the fishermen, something that we don't see in the film is that uh, in the fishing itself, um, sometimes the, 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 the tools that they use, the nets and other tools that they use for fishing, they come up uh, with oil. And it's quite common, and this I, I was witness to, it's quite common that animals, as you see in the film with the torso, it's quite common to see animals, uh, yeah, totally covered. Actually, um, the the one of the little jobs that people get out of the uh, oil industry in the area are as brigadiers that collect the the oil and put them in bags, and uh, these bags are put away, and sometimes they are taken by ships somewhere else or simply just left in the, in the coast, in, in, in beaches uh, along the, 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 the lake. And that's part of the culture. Uh, actually, it's always a little hope to work uh, as these brigadiers uh, collecting, collecting oil. Yeah, so then I would say something uh, taken as natural. 
I would say as well, according to what I have read, this is obviously not something that I have witnessed, is that there is a tradition of use of it, even by the indigenous people. Uh, many hundreds of years ago, thousand years ago, I don't know. Um, so because it, 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 was, it was something that was there as well, even though it was not ex extracted. But now obviously uh, the splits of, of it uh, makes it uh, quite massive and invasive. So yeah, going back to the question, uh, in my perception, I would say it's taken as something natural. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no... Uh, criticism around it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Alejandro, maybe would you like to comment on this, on, on let's say on the impact of the original cultures and indigenous communities? Sí, eh, mi yes. familia... My family comes uh, from that zone Maracaibo. So I can say that I have lived uh, submerged in this oil culture. I don't know what is this pre-oil culture. I can't understand Venezuela in, in a different way. So I know Venezuela and culture of Venezuela as the culture of oil. So it is uh, difficult to be critical. You know, we were trying to be critical, but not totally critical because it was always forming part of our everyday reality. Yeah, Venezuela has changed from a, an agricultural country to a country which is exporting oil. We also have to remember that in the 50s, Venezuela becomes the biggest country exporting oil. So we remember uh, also the, 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 um, the culture of exports to the USA, for example, the Lake Maracaibo has actually become a, a zone which has been sacrificed. It has been sacrificed in order to support the development of the country. So we have the Lake of Maracaibo and especially uh, the northeastern part is being explored all the time with petroleum wells. Yeah, so and uh, you can imagine it as a big uh, plate of spaghetti. You know, all these uh, uh, oil pipes are there, and these pipes, some of them, some of them have been there for years, and there are so many leakages you can't even imagine, and this oil in is, is leaking all the time, all the time, covering virtually the whole zone where it can be found. So there are zones which uh, where you can find permanently these oil leakages, and this is a long-term process. So the whole system, this whole pipe system is not being maintained. Apart from that, uh, last five to 10 years, we have lost all institutional capacities of protection. You know, there are no ways how to protect these zones. There is no possibility how to create a contingency plan which would help us to protect or recover uh, the, the environment. So this uh, pollution has been there for many years and is actually causing or leads to the fact that there are some zones where you can't live anymore. For example, in the south where you can find Congo uh, Mirador, there is still some or a little bit of biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, for example, just very recently, I, I was reading an article about fishes uh, living in this zone, but they were also saying that it is becoming more and more difficult 
uh, there we have, uh, for example, uh, people who actually focus and are specialized in crabs. Uh, there are fishing crabs and they need these crabs in order to ma their, maintain their livelihood. But the costs are actually rising and the costs at, uh, at the black market are also rising. So we are talking about social political costs and other costs and it is a totally destructive process uh, which is taking place right now and since uh, the director left the zone Annabelle, since uh, Annabelle left the zone it has becoming worse and worse so virtually all families have left all people have left just very very few people have stayed it is uh, not only about economic profitability it is is just so difficult to live there it costs so much money it is so expensive to live there and you can't find any ways how to earn money and how to earn your livelihood being there yeah mm -hmm. thank you Alejandro. yeah Annabel, actually i wanted to uh, give you the the word and also you can uh, add on what what alejandro said but also i think you've just been recently to congo mirador or to the area so maybe you can tell us how it looks and also what happened with the people uh, well, of the movie i wanted to begin by saying that i just bought one liter of uh, oil of a petrol in Maracaibo Lake for three dollars, and it can raise even more than that. Uh, that for a, for a fisherman, I mean, me, we went with the support of the of of uh, of the of the, of the IFA fund for distribution that we went to show the film there, uh, and we can have this luxury, but uh, a normal person cannot have have access to this, uh, to, 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 the, to, 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 to petrol in this price and a fisherman less of all. And of course they depend on a, a little bit adding to what Alejandro is saying. In the time that we were there, we could collect the stories of uh, different generations and the diversity of uh, fish there, I would say was much more uh, in the in two generations more in the people the people that are nowadays between 70 and 80 they could see um, a wider variety of fish and right now they what you see in the film that they fish is something that is locally called marianas uh, and this is a little bit like more down in the in the in the in the nutrition chain and uh, as well as the crops uh, and the crabs is, is a business actually very lucrative in the in the area, but it's the main the main source of fishing. Uh, and as well, and, and Alejandro knows much better is like far down in the in the nutrition uh, chain. Um, however, um, and in Congo Mirador, there are two things that I think are interesting in 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 human terms. Um, uh, there is, yeah, very few people left. There are actually three families with kids, youngs, and so on. And they themselves, they are keeping some canals made with travels. They travel these canals there to keep the access to this, this point of the, of, the, of the lake in which they can fish these crabs. And... Um, yeah, basically they are taking the, 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 the functions, the role of the state are, is being taken by these people there. They are taking the, 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 the it's as if nobody remembers us, uh, unless of all the, the, the government, well, we, we are doing the functions of it in this place. And this I find, of course, is, is, is dramatic because their life is quite tough. Still, I find in that impulse uh, as, a, as a citizen, as a Venezuelan citizen, I find hope. And I really wish that they are successful somehow. Yeah, uh, the people that left, however, in human terms talking, it is, 
yeah, almost tragic in, in lots of cases. Uh, actually, uh, we have been dealing with kids with tuberculosis. There is a, um, um, uh, there, there is a proliferation of tuberculosis in the area, which is a, an illness that was eradicated from Venezuela for many decades. Now it's coming back and in Maracaibo Lake is very present. Um, and as well, uh, for instance, the teacher, she left to teach in another uh, village, one of these villages called Ologas, and the, and the school there was closed. And it was closed, the, the, the reason that was given by the major, a major that is uh, corrupt, uh, the reason that was given by him is that there was not enough oil. So there is a, a scarcity of oil and actually, well, as I, I told you, it's quite expensive to get it. So then they closed the school and the teacher, she had to look for another job in, uh, up in the river, uh, Catatumbo River. And the best that she could do in terms of survival was to get together with a, with a, with a supervisor of one of these uh, um, farms there uh, and with the unfortunate uh, este, the, 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 the unfortunate event that she got pregnant so then now she is just she just gave birth to a baby with another girl that is a girl that is in the mid teens right now the, the same girl you see in the film she's mid teens now out of the school and they are totally dependent on this farm supervisor. So then, yeah, unfortunately she had fallen in this circle of poverty. Uh, that is the destiny with that little anecdote I want to illustrate what happens to many of these people. Joaini as well, is, she is living in, um, in some a hardcore shanty town in, in, uh, in uh, Maracaibo and living with an auntie that has been kind enough to receive her in her house. However, uh, being out of scholarity, she didn't get to know to read or write. So then it's totally uh, vulnerable. And uh, in the in us as a film team, we have become a bit like social workers which are without having the formation for it. And uh, well, we are doing what the Venezuelan society is doing, which is to do whatever we can to put patches on this problem. So then we have, as many Venezuelans have right now, we have an open collect to, to help these people. And we have had some success in that. So then for instance, we are trying to, to finance micro micro um, entrepreneurial thing, um, activity for for instance the teacher for the for Joaini some uh, Joaini she got as an inheritance from her grandmother who died from a diabetes without assistance um, she got from that grandmother the, the knowledge on how to sew. So then we're getting a, a sewing machine for this girl to see if she starts a little business within the Chanty town in, in, in where she lives. So then, you know, with all these comments, what I'm trying to illustrate you and the audience is, uh, well, of course, the problems, what, what the stakes are on, um, but as well, what, how the society, the civil society is massively responding in a whole gesture of solidarity of people for the people. And uh, yeah, this I could, ex I could say that this, this is general in the, in the country these days, which uh, is, uh, it is hopeful, but as well tells you the degree of uh, vulnerability in which the whole society is and as well the, the abandonment <laughs> you know of the of the leadership of the country mm -hmm. thank you annabelle uh, alejandro you are living in venezuela you you are there every day uh working uh, in as a civil society a representative uh, trying to improve uh, 
somehow what's going on in the country. Uh, how is it for you and for the people around you to live uh, there throughout uh, the, the crisis, the political crisis, the economic crisis? Um, uh, Annabel now mentioned that um, the gasoline costs, uh, I think, three dollars. But um, I think now the Maduro government increased the minimal monthly salary from about one dollar to about two dollars. So it, it's a bit. Um, it sounds a bit crazy when, like, when we compare this, right? So how how is it actually right now? One very particular element uh, that many people say is adversity. We live in adversity. It is a condition of life where all the elements of life are being affected. When we look at the other countries in crisis, you know, they go through an economic crisis or a social political crisis or even some European uh, countries with political crisis. But uh, in Venezuela, all elements, all elements that you can Im uh, imagine are affected. And that's what we call adversity. Adversity, it can't be something that uh, something that can be explained. You just have to survive just those people who can survive, because there are other people who can't survive. And I would like to speak uh, as a person. Last year, I had some healthy problems, and I had some some problems in, in, in my bladder. And it is something that doesn't need to become very serious. You can actually resolve it with a with a surgery but i couldn't pay for that so i had to go to a fun foundation and ask for money and that's what annabelle has said we all depend on solidarity of all of us for all of us and it is my own condition and i still feel very very privileged obviously because the majority the majority of Venezuela are not privileged and the situation has become so serious according to uh, to last service we know that venezuela is on the same level of poverty as the poorest African countries. The majority of population does not receive money which would cover their basic fundamental needs. The majority of people work on a black market. It is not the official economy that they participate in. The uh, economy is becoming more and more perverse and it is more and more difficult to survive uh, i live in caracas it is a bit better living here but in the south there are really zones which are so difficult there is absolutely no uh, state of control there are only armed groups so this is the perverse uh, economy which actually uh, takes the poor people and indigenous poor people to live in a very, very difficult and poor situation. The majority of people, you know, just imagine many, many women, they actually have to prostitute themselves. And children, children, they start working uh, when they're 11 years old or less. So this is very, very, very difficult. And people are living in a very difficult condition. There is a pro prohibition a decree, for example, which prohibits uh, the use of mercury, but nobody cares, you know, people just use it. So these are the living conditions that we live in uh, that are very, very difficult. But if you ask, how do we survive? I will answer you, I don't know. I don't know how we survive. We just do it. We just do it. But there is no answer to this question. You know, uh, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have imagined how a person could live in Congo or in any other poor country where the circumstances are so difficult as they are here now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alejandro. Yeah, the, the picture you are painting, the, the reality you are sharing with us is, is uh, absolutely horrific and it's um, each timeless that we hear about it from 
And maybe that's also why it's so important that films uh, like Annabelle's film um, uh, get screened in many places. Annabelle, I would like to ask you, does this film have some uh, kind of goal, uh, some um, uh, crowdfunding or something, like some kind of um, initiative that you are trying uh, to do something just beyond um, uh, raising awareness? Like maybe there is, you, you mentioned the, the um, uh, micro loans or the small businesses or something like that. Uh, so maybe if, if there is anything like how we can help or if we should share any links of any of your initiatives, then, then let us know. Yes, uh, yeah, we have, um, I mean, in a way that is, <laughs> uh, how to say, we are, we are doing the best we can as filmmakers doing the work of, <laughs> of uh, a, a social work. So then we are having to respond in the best way we can. And we have actually an open collect, permanent open collect. Uh, of uh, resources, but is destined to the people of the film. We decided to 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 concentrate on that, um, and slowly we are in our website. Once upon a time in Venezuela, you can find this uh, way of of contributing. If anybody in the audience wants to do so. Um, and with the time, we are going, we're trying to put references of, of the many foundations and NGOs that are out there doing uh, humanitarian work uh, within Venezuela and that are organizations that come actually from the civil society. Uh, but what we do is quite modest, I would say. I repeat, it is destined to the people of the film or that somehow are related with the with the with the with the film we did, uh, because it's the, the the world to which we can reach, and uh, and yeah, we prefer to 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 do the best we can with one if we can save or I don't like to say save, but if we can support one person and do it it uh, well enough, so then this person can you know stand a, a bit stronger within the situation for us that's that's a, a big big uh, achievement mm -hmm. um also um a few times we already mentioned uh during the discussion topics like the polarization and uh, the, the let's say the democratic backsliding and um did you feel that you had when filming did you feel you had some kind of restrictions on your freedoms or maybe now did you come back to venezuela are you perceived like a, a like a regime critic even though it's very subtle in your movie and i think that's why the movie is, is so so nice that, uh, that, that like there is nothing pushed that just tells the story of the people but we see that the political situation is um is basically the one of the root causes of what is going on yeah well right now we are dealing uh, mostly with the i would say the fear that some authorities have of letting us show the film in open in public spaces so our policy towards that and to you know to so first of all what we want is to, the film to to be seen by most people and uh, better if it's seen presentially and that if it's in the context of uh, discussions and uh, conversations so we would like that the film works for that as to trigger conversations in the in the within the society so um it's it's been quite common that we are are being denied certain squares and so on because the majors have fear you know and we prefer not to confront but to say okay you don't give me this square but give me another gap within the you know the streets and there we go so then we go where where we are allowed and it has been quite interesting the reception of the civil society again and we are working with the with the associaciones de vecinos neighbors neighbors associations um and and and, and other kind of organizations grassroots organizations and uh, our idea is to 
persevere into this direction and to get to a point in which we can just spread the film and that everybody uses it in the schools, in the, in, in the small groups, uh, in whichever way it is possible. And that's, yes, it's, it's like an ant's work. And uh, yeah, it, this is the, our nowadays difficulty. During the shooting, and this I think it might be interesting as well to talk about in this context, uh, what uh, the, the main serious challenge was to, to deal with the paramilitaries. And uh, I mentioned that because this is a, well, it's a phenomenon that is there. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, more than to think too. <laughs> to eliminate it, it is something that is very present in the, in the society. And um, we could, something that happened is that we could, so there was lots of fear around shooting the, or filming their presence within the, the village, which was a, an ethical problem for us because of course, it's an essential part of the story that shows what means um, the abandonment of, of societies or, or villages or cities, because in, in those cases, you know, armed groups, armed groups, they take over the, the, the control of these places. And, and we wanted to tell that, but was really not possible to, to, in order to keep security on the people uh, in the village and on us and, and you know, and even though we decided that a couple of those, those kids, they approached us several times asking us to shoot, to film uh, some songs that they did. They had some lyrics and they wanted to do some kind of video clips, um, you know, uh, like hip hop video clips with these, these stories. And months later, uh, we didn't find any more of these kids because they were, as this tends to happen, and this we saw it several times, how kids would be removed and you don't see them no more. And when you ask is that they have been executed for one reason or other, mainly because of disobedience of, to, the, to the, their leader. In there. So then these kids, they were uh, killed. One of them killed and another one, one fled to far away in the east of the country. And uh, this, I think, is going to remain with me as a person for, for a long time, because I wonder if we would have, if we would have, you know, filmed their, their stories, uh, that what they wanted to film, if we, if we would have uh, served as a medium for this, for these young guys that were not even 22 years old, 20 years old, actually one of them, they, he, all, he, he had uh, these spots in the face as a teenager and was, uh, yeah, he killed people, but as well, he had this impulse. And I, I will always wonder if, you know, things would, would have been a little bit different for this kid if he, if he, would, if he would have been given the opportunity to be something different than an assassin and to, you know, to record his hip hop uh, lyrics. With this, I want to, 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 to mean that the arts, arts might be within the, this, this uh, very complex con context, like the Venezuelan one. Arts, I think, could be a great way for chan channeling uh, deep problems like, for instance, the, the violence and, and everything that is attached with this paramilitary culture. And uh, yeah, yeah, these were the two main, these are, have been the two main obstacles of this film, socially speaking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When speaking about the paramilitaries, um, Alejandro, you are a um, researcher, you're academic. Um, how can you do actually research uh, in uh, different locations in Venezuela where maybe the paramilitaries are present? Like, what does it mean? Like, do we have some environmental studies from these places that are 
to a large extent controlled by these um, uh, violent groups? La situación en Venezuela con respecto a la investigación. The situation in Venezuela as regards different service or investigations or studies is very, very, very dif difficult. A university professor receives $20 per month. This is what he earns. He doesn't earn more and you can't live with that. Uh, mostly, um, the biggest part of the university is paralyzed anyway. Uh, life is paralyzed. So most of the studies are simply not being carried out. I am trying to document, docu uh, document the situation as regards the mercury pollution. But it is very, very difficult to do a transversal study, for example, because all regions and zones are very risky. You know, the risk is very high. And apart from that, it is very expensive. You, we talk about the mine price. What is it? What does it mean? This is the money that you have to pay. It is actually the gold that you need. So how many milligrams of gold you need in order to buy the fundamental uh, stuff. And nobody, nobody working for the university has got enough gold to uh, carry out these studies. You know, there is not enough uh, support uh, from um, the international com community either. Last year, there was a huge leakage of uh, dangerous uh, substances very close to a natural park. And the environmentalists and ecologists were asking to go there because they wanted to study the impact of this uh, leakage, but they were not allowed. So they didn't receive the petrol in order to go there. They didn't receive any support and money to go there. So we have no information. We have no data about the environmental situation in Venezuela. So what are we doing. We are trying to use the knowledge of the people. We call it the civil science. So it is the information that we receive from the people. This is the only information that we receive. And the situation is very serious and is becoming even more serious. It is not only about the money that a professor at the university would earn because it's simply ridiculous. The fact is that the university itself is very important for the country and it is very important for the environment, but the university is being destroyed. The installations, scientific installations are being destructed. Also, the Oceanology Center has been destroyed. And the same thing is happening at different universities, Universidad de los Andes, many, many different university institutions. We are talking about a systematic institutional destruction, which means the liberty, the university, liberty and freedoms are being endangered. At this moment, if you want to, I mean, it is very difficult to know what the situation looks like because we have no information about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have um, here a question from uh, from public. We are reaching slowly the um, end of today's debate. So um, I will uh, give this question to both of you. I would like to start with uh, Annabelle. Um, do you think the situation in Venezuela is going to get better anytime soon from the humanitarian point of view as well as from the environmental one? What a question. Um, I have faith in what the people are doing. I have faith in what we did as a film and this existed thanks to the cooperation with, you know, other filmmakers, uh, between filmmakers in the, in the diaspora, the ones that are inside and uh, filmmakers of other countries and this was possible. 
and I have faith in what I have seen on how people are responding and keep on going, keep going and keep, you know, building this net of that makes us a society besides, besides the, 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 the abandonment. Of course, um, it is uh, very cha chaotic um, in Spanish, Rio Revuelto, like a, you know, a river that is uh, totally all over, like a chaos. So then there's many things happening there still within that. Um, I, I trust in the capacity on, of the people. There is something in the culture that I think is saving us big time, which is this kind of joy, you know, that goes even through tragedies. And this is not exaggeration at all. And I think that this can, can carry us, I don't know for how long time. When I heard the deputy of her, and when I see this event, when I see the work that you're doing and, the, and, the, and that you are, you know, uh, giving us this platform to, to speak and you give the, the platform for this film to exist and the deputy of the European Union talks in this way, I, I, I feel faith and hope. Still, it might not be so grounded on reasons that have to do with the leadership. I don't mention the political leadership because I find it as an abstract, <laughs> abstract thing there that is not so related with the, with, the, with the people, but this is just an opinion. And I really mean even the opposition. And that's uh, painful to say, uh, still, I want to, to insist on, 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 on the capacities of the people. I am totally amazed and, and humbled on how people are responding to this situation. Yeah, Alejandro, um, so similar question to you. Do you think the situation uh, is going to get better anytime soon? And I will add one small question to this one. Um, in, like, why why should we worry, let's say, about the environmental uh, degradation, about the environmental situation? Why should we worry if we are not in Venezuela? Is it relevant for the rest of South America? Is it relevant for the rest of the world? So, la primera parte, mi respuesta no es for the first part, uh, the response is not an easy one. We will wait just for a second so that we can give a chance if the connection catches back. In the past five years, Seems we exhausted our luck and uh, now at the end Alejandro is, uh, is getting a bit frozen. Um, Alejandro, maybe if you can repeat your response because we couldn't sí, hear puedo, you. Aún puedo... Ajá, muy bien. Perfecto. Eh, decía que okay, mi, mi I was saying that there is a double uh, answer. The past five years have been very difficult in terms of social, economic and political aspects. Uh, in the moment when the uh, film ends, it's a moment of hope for change. But then what follows is a massive destruction process. For me, uh, leaving aside hope is uh, simply the fact you have to go forward all the time. There is a person who inspired me, uh, someone from uh, your country, the first president, uh, Václav Havel. He said roughly that hope is not a belief that something will happen. It is uh, the conviction that what you are doing has a purpose. This is what I wanted to share. 
same as Annabelle, I have uh, the confidence that this uh, population, this people is strong and resistant. And uh, this is so deep that uh, I simply have faith, not in the political process, but in the people of Venezuela. That's the first part. The second part of your question is why should we worry about this? For the development of a country, it is absolutely important. The destruction, the environmental destruction in Venezuela is endangering not only the development of the country in the long term, but the regional development. At the end of the 1990s, there was a series of wars in the center of Africa. The um, wars over the minerals. And uh, these were centered principally in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but it affected the rest of the countries. And also European countries and America were involved in it. This uh, led to an enormous humanitarian crisis. Venezuela has the possibility that at this moment there would be a war over minerals as well. This is already happening in parts of the country. And this not only has a potential of destabilizing even more uh, the country, but the entire region. On the other hand, the situation of Venezuela in terms of what is going on, the rate of deforestation of the Amazonic forest is so big that it endangers any objective of uh, the climate change effort. We have to uh, protect this area in order to be able to say that we will succeed in this as well. What is happening leads to a certain health condition that we are exporting uh, illnesses such as malaria. This affects uh, the health at regional level in America. So the environmental topic in Venezuela is of uh, great importance for many people, not only in Venezuela itself. We have received a lot of support from Europe. We hope to receive more. We need this support. Our associations are very, the civil society is very active. We believe in the future possibilities. We believe we'll be able to protect the environment, not only for Venezuela. This world has no borders and uh, the environment has no borders. Therefore, we should have a possibility. Uh, we have to understand that the environment in Venezuela is the global environment. Before I uh, give you both space for very short concluding remarks, I would like to read for you a comment um, that you are right now not looking on Facebook, but we, uh, we have a very nice comment on Facebook which says, first of all, I do really want to thank you for such a marvelous film. I have been living in Belgium since 2018 because of political reasons. Uh, there have been a long time ago since I do not have a life memory, but through your film, everything come back to my mind again. So this, um, so now we have this a uh, few very, very last minutes and I would like to give you space just to say whatever you wish to say. First of all, I want to insist in, uh, thank you, uh, one word is making such a beautiful and inspiring work that we, as filmmakers, we have been following for years. And thank you for this space. Uh, thank you for the, for the opening words were really absolutely touching and I think are gonna have a beautiful effect on the Venezuelan civil society. And uh, Alejandro, I'm uh, totally uh, in your service for collaboration. This is so inspiring to have heard you. And um, we as a team in Once Upon a Time in Venezuela.com, we are uh, always open for further conversation. 
and say, well, the film is there to, to be seen, to be shared, discussed, and I'm absolutely happy and humbled by uh, such, a, such a conversation as we had here. Thank you, guys. Alejandro, you can go ahead. Muy bien. Eh, primero, very well. uh, firstly, I do thank you very, very much for having us here, for uh, giving us the floor, for giving us the space to talk and to share with you our uh, thoughts. But I would like to give thanks to the whole festival, to the whole festival. And thank you, thank you very much, especially to Annabel Rodriguez for this beautiful, sadly beautiful film, which reminds us of what is happening in Venezuela. But it also reminds us of things that we can do and everything that is being reflected in this uh, film is what uh, Hannah Arendt says is uh, banal, is evil. And I would also like to thank to all the team that has supported us. Thanks uh, thank to all of you for your patience with this terrible internet connection that we have here in Venezuela. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for this possibility. And I hope that we will continue this conversation. And uh, I think, and I hope that also other people here in Venezuela will be able to continue in this debate. Thank you very much from the deepest side of my heart. Actually, the connection lost, which was happening in real time during um, our discussion today, is the topic of the festival. So it's completely fine. There is no problem about it. We are fitting well with the with the main topic of the festival. <laughs> and with this, I will close. I thank you both very much. Um, it's been a great pleasure uh, talking to you. And also, I would like to thank very much uh, to our audience for their time and interest. So from my side, it's all for tonight. Have a nice rest of the day or evening.